Hello friends, welcome to Experience Data Talk, a show featuring data science leaders and technologists from around the world. My name is Mike Delgado, and this is episode number 126. Today we're chatting with Dr. John Johnson, CEO and co-founder of Edgeworth Analytics, a world-class economic consulting firm using econometrics and economic theory to develop careful analysis in antitrust, class certification, labor and employment, and damages related matters. Dr. Johnson has served as an antitrust expert witness in high stakes cases in the United States, Canada, Europe, and Asia. He's also authored several academic papers on labor class actions and an amicus brief to the US Supreme Court. Dr. Johnson earned his PhD in economics from MIT. In today's show, Dr. Johnson talks about the art of communicating complex data insights in understandable ways and why solving business problems with data starts by asking the right types of questions. He also discusses ways his firm has used data science in litigation, trials, and court cases, and how we can all identify and avoid confirmation bias when analyzing business data. Dr. Johnson also talks about how his firm was hired to analyze player injury data in the National Football League, and how their data insights led to changes in the NFL kickoff rule. He also shares a ton of other fascinating insights and helpful ways we can all become better data storytellers. Here's our conversation. All right, John, welcome to Data Talk. Uh, thank you. Great to be here. So, uh, tell us a little bit about your company and the work you're doing right now. Well, uh, my company is called Edgeworth Analytics, um, and we have a sister company called Edgeworth Economics. But our analytics company basically does uh, takes data sets and tries to answer practical problems with them. We have a, a very sort of high tech workforce of programmers and PhD economists and statisticians sort of look at the data in different ways and try to make sense of it for all sorts of different issues. Uh, our sister economics company does the same thing, but in the context of litigation. So we have expert witnesses that testify on data issues. But the kind of common theme of our work is what can you meaningfully learn from the data? What are both the strengths and weaknesses of a given data set? And sort of trying to answer intelligently and simply, all right, here's what this means and here's what it doesn't mean. What are some of the some of the big challenges that companies have when they approach your company? Well, it, it can vary. So, you know, one of the things that we generally find is that companies that approach us are having either some specific problem where they need help to understand. Um, I just need to know with a more rigor what the answer to this set of questions is. That's sort of one set of clients. Mm. Then we have sets of clients that come to us like, we know we can get more information from our existing data sets, but our job is to run a company, not to know how to process random HR data combined with financial data. The data is not ready to use. So can you help us synthesize this in a way so we can actually put all the pieces together? And then the third types of questions tend, as I said, to be more in the litigated setting where it's, okay, we have some kind of pending lawsuit. Mm. Um, we're trying to understand what the data means, what the implications of the data are. Um, and those types of cases can be, you know, involve very, very large data sets. We've had cases where we've had data on every chocolate candy bar sold in the U.S. So, you know, oh, those wow. massive data sets in terms of, you know, the, the, the types, the variety um, so the point is that we have a pretty broad ranging practice, but again, common theme is we're, we don't want, we want to show you we're smart by answering your questions simply and being your partner, mm. not by trying to show off that like we can do sort of cool statistical stuff. I mean, I like cool statistical stuff yeah. and if necessary, we'll do it. But if I can give you a simple answer uh, with your data, that's the way to go. Mm. What, what sort of, um, like te- you mentioned you have economists, what sort of teams do you have there? Right. So we have a, a pretty wide range of people there. Primarily, you know, we are a lot of us are from a tradition of uh, what's called econometrics, which is the field that marries economic theory to statistics. So we have a number of PhD oh. economists who have statistics backgrounds. And so that's what my PhD is in, is in econometrics. A number of my colleagues have this econometric specialization. And so what's a nice advantage about that is that is a very pragmatic approach to statistics where you're trying to marry it with the way companies actually work and how business really works. Um, but we have to be good statisticians and we have some statisticians on the teams. Um, and then we also just have some other MBAs types on the teams who are sort of, you know, have a little bit more of the business background. So that's generally the scope of our teams. I mean, we have a, a person who was a lawyer once on our teams, <laughs> um, but for the most part that our undergraduate researchers are generally economics and computer science backgrounds. 
So that's sort of the profile. Now, again, we do emphasize writing because, again, so much of what we do is translation. Mm -hmm. uh, and what I mean by that is not language translation. It's like, how do you make the data simple enough that someone can understand without being insulting, but with being affirmative? So we also do a pretty good emphasis on sort of writing skills and things like that on our teams. What are, um, I love that you guys are focused on making very complex data uh, simple and be able to communicate that to leadership. What are some of the, I guess, challenges or questions that companies have for you before they hand over data to you? Again, because we are often in a, whether it's in a litigated setting or a business setting, you know, we have built up and one of the biggest investments we've made in our company has been our infrastructure as well as utilizing smartly cloud computing and other resources in terms of different types of security. But you know, there's a lot of requirements and regulations. There's a lot of issues with encryption at rest, with having sort of, you know, uh, some of the things we do have personal identifying information. So we need to be able to have that appropriately dealt with. Um, generally, we have protocols in place where we'd always have our IT department sort of works with companies to make sure we kind of have safe and secure transmission, what we're going to do with the data, what the limitations are on the data. Um, but it is, you know, there is an element of, um, I don't want to use the phrase dating, but it's kind of like that. When somebody's going to share this kind of, you know, detailed information, they need to have confidence that, you know, you know what you're doing and you're secure and that you have the right steps in place. So we've spent a lot of time um, to develop that infrastructure to give our clients confidence that we you know, have the appropriate security and we're constantly updating and, you know, making sure we're as cutting edge as we can be. So we have, obviously not surprising, an IT department that deals with this all the time in terms of security and privacy issues. I love you described it as dating, like you're kind of building that relationship with that company <laughs> so they feel secure with you. It is. And it's also, you know, good data work. Look, I can look at a data set. You can hand me a data set and say, hey, here it is. What do you think? And I say, well, what is the data set? And why did you give me this data set? And what's the question you're asking? And what do you, tell me about your business. You know, good data work doesn't happen in a vacuum, right? I'm not saying we should just create data work that just leads to confirmation bias, where a client says, well, I think this, and you confirm that's true. We have to be careful about that. But at the same time, for me to dive in and learn something about your business um, and not really understand it well, and not understand at least where your problem is coming from and what your perspective is, makes me a very ineffective data analyst. And so, you know, I did uh, a lot of work involving mushrooms <laughs> and I went and toured mushroom farms in Kennett Square, Pennsylvania um, to learn all about that industry so I could effectively look at their pricing data. Oh, wow. um, you know, when we deal with these things, we try to figure out what is the real business problem. Um, I recently ran a class for a firm. It's one of the things we do is we sort of go on this is before coronavirus hit, but we go on site and we try to get people together, almost like a data facilitation. And what was so interesting, it was basically an HR group we were working with at a large firm. And as we started to talk about how to interpret the data, what we found the most useful part of our class was, was getting people from different parts of the company to talk to each other about which data sets they had that they could relate to each other and they could start to answer each other's questions. So I wouldn't underplay a really big part of doing effective data work. Yes, you have to be technically skilled, but there's an awful lot of communication and sort of education that comes with this type of work that is so critical because that's how you get the best work product. That's how you get the best answers is if we really understand. So I always joke, one of the best parts of my job is I kind of get to come in and learn about so many different industries and companies because I get to say, oh, what does your data look like? What's your problem? Oh, here's what we can do to help you. So I, I love that um, you went to the mushroom to figure out how mushrooms were was it like the farm? What was it? The farm. I actually toured the farm to see how they were grown, what the cycle was, how they ultimately, you know, sort of what was the front end production? What were things that were changing in terms of the forecasting or things like that? So, yeah. So, again, there are different reasons that we sometimes have to depend on the questions we're answering. And I don't just go willy nilly to see things. I mean, <laughs> really interesting. But I'm not uh, doing that all the time. But at the same time, there is a lot of um, when you can either physically be somewhere, talk to people who are actually in the business, you learn more, um, and then you bring a different view to the data. And as I said, we're always guarding for confirmation bias. What I don't want to do is sort of have a client tell me what they think the answer is mm. and to justify it. Because otherwise, what's the purpose of using the data at all? <laughs> mm. But at the same time, if I can kind of look at it and perhaps see it from a different angle or understand, oh, they think this but in fact, if you look at it just a little bit differently, it's more than just point one. It's actually 
a little bit more complicated. And here's the insight you can have. So there's always an aha moment, as I say, when you're working with a data problem. Um, that's when we know we've done a good job and we kind of provide the insight that people weren't expecting, but is actually on point. Mm. So do you find that um, as you're working with different companies, they bring you in, they share with you their data sets, they have a certain business question and a thought of what they think the answer could be. Um, do you find that in the majority of cases you are um, finding like an even better business question to be asking? Sometimes we do. I mean, it's interesting because I've had situations where we were hired for a purpose. We were brought in. We found an answer. We told the company the answer. They didn't like the answer at all. <laughs> um, you know, and then I had to go and explain exactly how I came up with the answer. And ultimately, we kind of won them over. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, oh, OK. So how do we fix it? So there's those kind of things. It just really depends on the types of, you know, what the engagements are. Sometimes it's a surgical strike. Sometimes it's, you know, a much broader thing. But we can always sort of say, hey, you can look at it this way, or you might be able to answer this too. Is that of interest to you? Going in to talk to a company or executives about a business problem you're, you're um, researching to try to solve, find an answer to, and you realize that the answer you came up with is not going to be something that's going to make the senior leader is very happy. Mm -hmm. So what is your, your advice for data scientists, for um, people who are about to present some data mm -hmm. uh, to leaders who they know are probably not going to like that answer? Yeah. So I think the first thing is, um, you know, when you do credible work, part of how you can get over an audience that may be cynical or unhappy with the answer is to be methodical and to take them on the journey with you. And not even, you know, so if I'm going to make a presentation to a company where I have an answer that's not going to make sense to them or they're not going to like, then I need to do the extra steps of thinking about how am I going to present this in a way that is systematic and that's going to take you through step by step. Okay, we looked at the data this way and this is what we found. So this led us to look at the data this way and this is what we found. Oh, but then we did this and this is where the surprise came. We cut it this way, this way, this way. We find the same answer. Um, what often happens is people question and try to find the mistake in your work. Oh, mm -hmm. you did this. So the other part of it is, though, if you've got that rapport where you're talking with the client enough to sort of learn the business and see the holes, you know, you don't ever want to get to the executive presentation if you haven't vetted it along the way. Um, at the same time, there are some companies that's what they want you there for. They maybe don't they don't want you to just parrot the answer that they want. I mean, maybe some do. But for the most part, I find people are interested in what the real answer is, but they will ask hard questions. The hard questions are usually about and where it gets difficult is not about what regression analysis I ran or what statistical technique I used, although I've gotten those questions, too, because it's amazing how many data people there are out there that have sort of <laughs> enough knowledge to be really dangerous. But um, <laughs> things like, um, you know, why doesn't that square with what I know about my business that I've been in for 20 years? How do you square that with this fact that I know? And so those are the kind of things that become more challenging. When you're being a question like that, sometimes it's easy to be offended uh, or take offense uh, when you're kind of being grilled about the data, your insights. How do you, um, how do you kind of manage that? Well, one thing that is good is because part of my work is testifying as an expert witness, I'm really used to being grilled. <laughs> <laughs> and so that does build up a certain skill set where you have to have a certain thick skin about it. But again, I think in most consulting engagements, you know, you're trying to genuinely help and they want answers. So I think it is important to try to be dispassionate where you can be. Um, I'm an excitable guy. You know, I'm really passionate about data. So people usually know my energy level is high. But I think it's just important to remember that if you're constantly focused on what the client, what is the question the client wants answered and how are you helping them? If you can keep bringing it back to how you're helping them and how those insights will matter, I think that's what clients really respond to. You know, they don't want to be told in a heavy handed way. We brought in these outside consultants and they're saying they know our business better and how, you know, it's, it's partly tone. You know, I, I don't want to be so arrogant as to come in and pretend I know the answer to every question. What I want to do is say, I have a certain expertise and certain insights I can do to help you in a partnership that is going to help you get to where you need to be in a way that you probably can't get alone without the extra expertise we're bringing to the table. I think that's a much healthier way to approach it. Mm -hmm. um, at times when you, if you come across heavy handed, the tone is wrong, that's mm -hmm. when you get feedback that's less positive. 
Yeah, you must have like lots of experience being grilled. <laughs> I do have lots of experience being grilled about uh, some, and sometimes some really technical things because yeah. that's a big part of my expert witness job is that I testify in statistics quite a bit. So I do get, you know, there are depositions, there's trials, there's, you know, uh, appearances in front of the judge where you have to, you know, now you're trying to take, hmm. you know, think about this, right? At least when a business person's hired you for a consulting assignment, they really care about the answer. What about when you're in a trial, you're trying to explain to a jury who's been sitting there for a week in some mm. case, like, okay, here comes the next expert witness. What are you talking about? Mm -hmm. like, I make that interesting to you. Mm -hmm. And you know, you leave, right? So um, yeah, it's a little different, but it does equip me well for some of the other things they do. How does your, I guess, your communication, your persuasion strategy differ when you're talking with an executive? versus being on tribal trial? You know, look, for me, I was a professor for a few years. I um, left fairly quickly. I only did about two years because I, I thought I was going to be like the most popular professor on campus, but I was just a little lonely. I found it to be kind of... <laughs> and so, you know, I am kind of a teacher at heart in that respect. And I don't really change the way I am if I'm testifying or if I'm presenting to an executive, you know, that is sort of the key is to actually be credible and objective. So if you do objective work and you don't have to change your persona at all, mm. um, that's what I do. But what I do try to do is be the teacher and be responsive to, you know, here's how I really firmly believe the way you help someone. And, you know, I, I will, I don't have to prove to someone I'm smart. What I have to do is I have to help them feel smart <laughs> by explaining to them things in a way that they understand. My real job, I've done my job really well if I've broken things down simply enough that people feel like they learned something, but they weren't insulted by my presentation. And that's the art. But, you know, that's not easy. You have to spend, mm -hmm. spend a lot of time thinking just about here's how we're going to present X, Y, Z. Presentation is a critical part of good data work. It really is. And so, and every time we put up an infographic or a, you know, a map or anything, one of the things we're doing as part of the coronavirus right now is we have a whole coronavirus impact study project that we are running on our analytics website. And so every day we put up different data oh. studies. Um, one of the things we have is an interactive map of the state of Maryland that when Maryland released all of their coronavirus cases, we have a, a, a map based out of Tableau where you can click on every single zip code and see the number of cases and then it's sort of grown. We've matched it to zip code level demographic data. Now we've matched it to locations of congregate care facilities. Oh. So it keeps growing in different ways in terms of what you can get out of it. But as we've been doing these different things, we have daily, uh, weekly updates on the unemployment numbers and putting them in perspective for how big they really are. Um, and so as we do these different things, it's different ways that we're showcasing and thinking about, all right, how do you make this data, which is really critical right now, make mm -hmm. sense? Um, and so it's a good showcase for us. And it's a good way that we can kind of give back to the community at a time where there's just a lot of hunger for data and information. So I think that's a good example of taking some problems. I mean, I'm not an epidemiologist, <laughs> so I'm not giving medical advice, but I am an economist who can look at sort of how does the data relate as states start to reopen? What's going on with the number of cases? Um, how big are these unemployment numbers we're seeing? They're kind of mind blowing. Um, one of the things we did is we put out a uh, infographic where we took the sea level and said, you could imagine with 33 million um, unemployment claims, that's the equivalent of the sea level rising to cover the entire United States up to Omaha, Nebraska. Wow. <laughs> wow. Um, and, and it's just incredible. Like when wow. you start, to, so, but one of the points of that, back to the question that we started with, is simply, what you do when you deal with data, that's more powerful than, mm -hmm. you know, 33, per, 33 million is the biggest since the Great Depression. Well, that is true. But what does that mean? Right? Yeah. You're looking for ways to make it real. Yeah. I, I really like that. So it makes it visually understand. Like, yeah, I can kind of like visually see that, like the sea level. Yeah, that's exactly. A really good metaphor. I mean, we did one earlier on where we were dealing with... Um, in the very first weeks, we had a couple of other examples. And one of them was, you know, if the usual commute for um, someone is 26 minutes, uh, the initial increase in unemployment claims the first week of coronavirus was the equivalent of having a 22-hour commute, right? <laughs> and so you hear these phrases, yeah. unprecedented. And you right, hear right, right. You talk all the time about these things. And, you know, but without trying to put it in some context, mm -hmm. not as helpful. And so 
I, I'm a big fan of visualization and thinking hard about how do you take the numbers and then translate it to visuals. So there's a couple of reasons for that. One is people learn in different ways. And so what people can relate to, not everybody's a numbers person. So if you can translate the numbers to, yes, there's ways you can talk to people that really love numbers. There's ways you can talk to people that tend to like visuals. There's ways you can talk to people that like to read things, right? And so I think that overlaying really smart, and again, I'm not an education person, I said, but I was a professor, but thinking hard about how people learn makes you do better work when you're a consultant, and especially a data consultant, where you're trying to really educate people so they understand what you're doing. I love your your creative process and coming up with things that are very relatable. I'm curious about like what is like your guys' process for kind of developing, like you have these really interesting insights, these data points, and now you're trying to make it very meaningful and relatable. And you just shared some really cool examples, the sea level, um, mm -hmm. the being in traffic, the commute, yeah. like those are extremely relatable. Mm -hmm. um, visually, it can be vi visually stunning to see it. Um, where do you guys come up with these creative ideas? Well, I'm very fortunate to have a really creative team. I mean, one of the things we try to really do because we do so much practical work, um, you know, first, I'll be honest, just sort of from a peer management perspective, we make it clear to everybody that nobody has a monopoly on the good ideas. So we do have a pretty open workforce where we're like, you know, at all levels, as we're talking about projects, we really do foster an environment where people can sort of weigh in with their ideas. And then I think there's just a certain view. And, and I think some of this is we hire, because we have this interesting hybrid of people that have academic backgrounds, people that tend to be good teachers, um, or people that have business backgrounds, we kind of always have this interesting creative mix of people. So when we talk about things, we do vet them with each other in a way where it's not just on the teams, but just talking to each other about, hey, we're looking for an idea on this. What do you think about that? What's been effective in other contexts? So it is hard work to come up with the really good examples, but I think that's a critical, critical part. Mm -hmm. that, you know, what we are really trying to sell to our clients is the ability to make something really make sense and sing to them. You know, one of my favorite projects we ever did was we did a lot of work for the NFL Players Association right around the last uh, negotiation for the oh. contract. And what we did is we were hired to help them with the injury information and to process all that injury data and figure out where were the most dangerous plays and what was the actual cost to the players of an extra game or an extra two games or things like that. And so we did this really interesting work and we found out, and we, I kind of hate to take credit for part of this, but we found out the most dangerous play in football is the kickoffs. Because what's happening, both ends are running and they're going full speed ahead. And that's what the data suggests the most oh. interesting. Error. Not surprising in retrospect, but not obvious before. Right, right. right. I wouldn't think that. <laughs> right. So one of the things they did in part, part based on our studies, that's why they moved the kickoffs back. Really? Yes. And so that was kind of cool, you know, like, and so that's kind of a neat thing where we got to do something that had a lot of, you know, practical interest. But it was data driven, which was pretty cool. And so I just love that kind of stuff where we can yeah. help in interesting contexts. That's kind of what makes our job so much fun. It's critical. I mean, at the end of the day, you have to be able to tell the story with the data. Um, now, that, as I said, it's not about making the data fit the story. It's kind of the reverse, right? It's what is the data telling us? Okay, let's sort of see what that story emerges. So um, again, it's a very... I never imagined this is exactly what I'd be doing. I thought I was going to be an economics professor the rest of my life when I was in school. Right? <laughs> um, but I, the fun part of what we do is just, as I said, finding insights in places where people you know, might not expect them and being able to give real practical use for data. I mean, one of the biggest frustrations I think companies have with their data is they don't know how to get any answers out of them. I've got all this data and it's not speaking to each other and I got a question, but it's not talking to me. What do I do? Right. Because data doesn't come ready to use. And so that's why it is so important that there be a process where you what is the question you're asking? All right. What data sets do you have at your disposal that would be useful for that? What's the best technique to sort of get to the data? What is the preliminary data showing us? All right. Now that we're into the data, what else do we need? You know, you've got to be organized and systematic about it. But the focus on asking the right question will always lead to the best answer. You don't focus on the question up front. You know, I don't want you to just sort of start. I mean, the number of clients I also have are like, okay, well, we're just going to send you all our data tomorrow. Mm -hmm. no, stop. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do that. <laughs> um, 
let's talk about what you want to accomplish. Let's yeah. talk about the kind of data you have. And, you know, sometimes that requires patience. You know, you've got to kind of educate clients about that. But that's a big part, I think, of what a good data person does is they're there to assess, think through carefully, and make sure we understand what the data is going to show us. Do you find that as you are um, first kind of beginning your investigation around helping to answer a good business question, that your question, like you get more questions during that time, that you're recreating a question? Yeah, it's like peeling an onion, to use another analogy, right? You literally, you know, you can start thinking somebody's problem is X, and by the time you're done, you're answering Y and Z. I mean, that's part of the evolution of it. Um, yeah, it is amazing how much a little bit of information goes a long way. I mean, sometimes it feels like you're playing a video game, right? You know, people get really addicted to your models or your things like, oh, this is great. Can we tweak this? Can we do this? Can we do this? I'm like, okay, wait a second. Let's see. Why are we doing this? You know, like, uh, <laughs> that, you know, bringing a certain level of creativity to the data analysis, I think, is a really exciting part of what we do. And um, I think that differentiates us in a lot of ways because it's not just about some cookie cutter answer. It's about having people that are really thinking hard about your question. And so that's how I always talk about our company in a way that I'm the proudest of what we do is that, you know, we're going to bring really smart thinking to your question for you and help you together to work out what are you trying to answer? What can you or can't you answer? And what does that ultimately mean for you and your company and whatever outcome you're looking for? What advice do you have for the data scientists that are listening in that want to improve their storytelling? Mm -hmm. Um, they want to improve the way that they're communicating um, their data uh, to different leaders. Well, I would say first, look, I mean, the art of communicating is a whole separate piece of this. And so sometimes people that love data and methodology, you know, catching yourself when you're talking in jargon. You know, when I was at MIT, they used to talk to us about explain this to someone like you're explaining it to your grandmother. And that has stuck with me forever. <laughs> like, that's a really, really critical piece of this. And so I think the notion that spending time on the communication strategy, spending time on how you're going to convey what you did, not getting stuck in the jargon of, OK, what is this or what is that? But what did you really do and why and what does it show? Those are the kinds of practical things you have to do. And I guess the other thing I would just say is don't underestimate the preparation for communicating the results is as important as preparing the results. So you want to have, you have to do careful work, but you also then have to think about how are you going to present the analyses and do time, time spent on that is critical. It's not secondary or the last thing you do. It's a part of the process. That's so right on. It, it's funny. I was, I was working on a report and um, it's funny how you spend so much time working on your project. And after all that time, sometimes it gets boiled down to like two slides on a deck. Right. <laughs> right. And that might be a real sign you did your job well. Right? If you can get that precise an answer, then you did your job really well, most likely. Because again, again I'm a big fan of sometimes the simple answer is the right answer. Um, it doesn't always have to be complicated. You add nuance and complexity to get to the right place. But it doesn't have to be um, the fact that I need 25 pages of results to actually convey what I learned. Yeah. And I like what you said about the preparation and being thoughtful and how you present the data is just as important as you were you know, as the work as preparing that data and analyzing the data. What if you were to like look at um, your projects and the amount of time spent on analyzing asking the questions, thinking about how best to uh, tell the story, to present it, would you say that like, you know, 80% of the time is around doing the actual work, coming up with the insights, and then 20% of the time is around the, the storytelling part of it? Or would you say is it 50-50? Um, I think it, I don't think it, it depends on the size of the data sets, you know, because obviously if you have a massive data project with more data or more complexity, then that just takes more computational time, more programming time, more analysis time. But I, I think it's safe to say that in every project, it's at least 20% is on the communication, but that that's a little misleading because I'm talking about just the end part of the communication. You know, there's a lot along the way in the thought process. So we kind of embed it or, you know, I'm thinking about how I'm going to communicate the results from the first day that I'm structuring the question mm -hmm. and what I'm actually, so it's all throughout, 
But then the actual separate art of, okay, now I have a set of results I'm comfortable with. Now I just want to work purely on the presentation part. Mm -hmm. I think that is the last 20%. So it's important that it's both. But at the end, yeah, there is a separate piece, which is just about, okay, how do we communicate this effectively? How, how often do you uh, communicate back with um, the different companies you're working with? Because sometimes, I mean, you don't want to shock them <laughs> at the end. You want them to kind of know where you are in the process. And if you're finding some other data points that contradict what they're thinking, uh, I'm kind of curious, like, how often are you communicating with them? It really depends on the cadence we get with the different clients. You know, so there are clients, you know, and especially in our litigated disputes, we're mainly working with law firms and clients. And so in those cases, I think the communication is far more regular. In our consulting work, I think it just depends. There are clients that want to talk really regularly and there's clients that just want to sort of an occasional check in. I think we try to come up with some sort of workable schedule with the clients up front, but also if there's something that's changed it significantly, I want to flag that up front. I don't want to wait till the end and surprise. So I do like to live by the rule, no surprises if possible. Um, I think we have enough surprises in the world right now. <laughs> this is actually the very first data talk we've ever had where we talked to someone like you who works around litigation. Um, mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit more about like what sorts of products do you work on Sure. where it's involved in court cases. All right. So basically for me, my practice, and a lot of my firm's practice, we generally deal in a few areas um, that are very data intensive. Antitrust litigation, labor and employment litigation are two areas we do a lot of work in. And those are cases where there's some product at issue where you need transactional data, often for an entire industry. <laughs> wow. Um, you know, um, or um, on the labor side, personnel data. And so those cases can involve things like price fixing, cartels, monopolization claims, um, discrimination claims. And so we really have to do a deep, deep dive. Um, you know, I had one case that went on for many, many years, and it's recently concluded. And we had a favorable jury verdict after working on something for about eight years. Wow. Um, but it involved every shipment of groceries from the wholesalers to the grocery stores in the Midwest for 10 years. What? So there was this so we had these terabytes of grocery shipment data that we had to process and make sense of. And so um, so the point is, in the litigation context, there are a lot of cases that have that need large scale data capabilities and then need an economist or a statistician to interpret what does the data mean and not just damages, but also just sort of what happened to pricing? How did the pricing evolve? What happened to wages? What's the right benchmark? So, so that's the kind of stuff we do, but it is actually another area that is very, very data intensive. Um, and we have to do good work. And there's always someone on the other side that's also dissecting these data sets. And so it's a really, um, you know, it's a very high standard when you mm -hmm. do it. And I think that makes us much better in our consulting work. Not so much because we're there on the consulting projects, we're not there because of litigation at all, but we bring a certain rigor and approach that helps us sort of spot things that we would maybe wouldn't see if we weren't sort of bringing that level of rigor to the table. What's it like? I mean, working on a project for eight years, a data project. Brutal. <laughs> Look, I mean, um, there are times where these things can go on a long, long time and you have to build these data sets. You basically nurture them. You explore what they mean. Um, Think about same thing, preparing testimony. Um, that case ended up in a jury trial, so I had to go explain to a jury what I had done. Um, you know, so it they, they go through life cycle. You really become an expert on things. Um, that's a long project, I must admit. Yeah. Um, time. Um, sometimes I joke that I can sort of tell the age of my kids by what I was working on at different points in time. You know, <laughs> so. <laughs> but. Um, you know, but you do get to really know the data well and you get some insights that you might never get otherwise. So I think it's just made me such a better, I mean, I always say this even from the time I was a professor to now, I'm such a better economist having done the various types of work I've done because, mm -hmm. you know, I had really good training, but training was kind of book training. But now I actually have gotten to see how a lot of different things work. Um, and again, you know, all of our litigation work is generally confidential. So it's not like those data after that litigation is over, that data set is gone and back to the company and that's the end of it. But that doesn't mean that there aren't insights about how people think about business or just things like that, or even just questions about what do people understand or don't understand about data. And that does make us better economists in terms of the next time we look at someone's problem and say, okay, well, let me help you think about it. Here's the kinds of things that I remember people didn't understand in the past types of things I've done.
I love that um, you're like a teacher at heart and that's kind of like guided you with your storytelling. Have you always been like that, a person that just loves to like be able to explain things simply? Yeah, <laughs> always. I mean, I was a little kid, like little, little, I would play school and I wanted to be the teacher oh. and I always would sit there and think about like, how could you explain this better? And I can just think of infinite times in my life where that was always like, I always had a better way. I mean, there's a little bit of, you know, precocious kid where you want to slap them on. <laughs> but, um, but that's kind of always who I've been. And that's what made me an entrepreneur is that I thought I had a better way. And knock on wood, I think I have had a successful <laughs> entrepreneurial career as well the last 10, 11 years. So I think that's part of it is you do have, you know, when likes lots of things in life, there's a part of your personality that's just innate. And I feel very fortunate that I found an outlet for myself that actually amplifies that part of my personality, the person that likes to teach and mentor and develop and answer questions um, thoughtfully and be helpful. That's kind of, I think, why it's such a good fit for me. When did you realize that, it, you you know, becoming an entrepreneur and, and working in this field, when did you realize like this is what you wanted to do? I'm still wondering. <laughs> 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 well, you know, look, I think... Um, it's funny when I started my firm. It was in 2009 during the last recession, <laughs> mm. um, and there were a few of us. I had um, two colleagues, three colleagues. One who had been working with me at my former firm. Another who was my best undergraduate student at Illinois, and I had kept in touch with him. And I asked him if he wanted to come out and run our HR for us. Um, and so, you know, we started it, and. I don't think we knew what we were doing at first. Like, I don't know that you ever really yeah. grasp what you're embarking on and the challenges you'll have. But, you know, sort of somewhere along the way, it just kind of happens. Like, your vision comes together. You have some early successes. You keep at it. You suddenly realize, you know, wow, I'm doing what I'm meant to do. I don't know that there was some moment. I do remember a lot of people telling me as I started to have success, oh, I always knew you were going to be an entrepreneur. And I'm like, how did you always know? I didn't know I was going to be an entrepreneur. So, that's an interesting part. And, you know, and look, it's not all glory. I mean, things like the coronavirus we're dealing with is incredibly stressful for any business owner. Even if you're having success, that doesn't mean you're not watching everything. You're not worried about what's going on and what's going to happen next. And are clients going to stop using your services? I mean, it's just part of the environment we're all living in. So, you know, there's a lot of good and a lot of great things that come from being an entrepreneur. And there's also a lot of um, stress, too. And so, I definitely know this is what I was meant to do, but I don't know there was a moment when I realized, I don't even know there was a moment I realized, oh, we're going to be a success. It mm -hmm. just happened. What I do remember is I never thought we were going to fail. And I think maybe that was the most important thing. And I, I don't know how that happened either. I just remember that was not, failure was never an option. That wasn't mm -hmm. something I was thinking about. It was always just like, what else do we do? What's the next thing we do? How do we hustle? How do we get out there? How do we make, how do we take this vision being someplace where we can explain complicated things simply and how do we take that to the market that was always and continues to be kind of the way i think about the business earlier you mentioned the, the work you're doing around COVID 19 and the the visualization tableau map uh, from maryland Are, i'm curious about any sort of um interesting insights you found from just analyzing the data mm -hmm. in maryland Right. So, so far, you know, we have a number of reports on our website. We're putting them out almost daily at this point on a whole bunch of different things. And a lot of them sort of write this intersection of economics and COVID-19. And part of the reason for that is we're in this unusual situation where we have an economic crisis that is critically dependent and actually caused by a health crisis. So all of us who are economists have to deal with the reality that, first of all, the rules are a little different than what we've seen in prior recessions. And the economic crisis can't really get better without effective solutions to the health crisis. And so what we've seen when we looked at sort of some things that, you know, I think surprised me. And you know, last week, a lot of unemployment numbers came out. And, you know, every week there's the unemployment insurance numbers. But what came out last week was our first really detailed government jobs report, which is sort of the data sets that tell you a lot more. The thing that struck me the most about the employment situation last week was just the breadth of the losses. I mean, the data... We all know restaurants, accommodations, like hotels, airlines have been hit hard. But what we're actually starting to see already, and we, the data even that's been released is still lagging a little bit, which is something important because they, it's not like government data sets come out instantly. The COVID cases come out every day, but the economic data doesn't. 
And so, but seeing the breadth of sort of this is starting to creep into so many more sectors um, beyond that, you know, in terms of manufacturing, in terms of, you know, just the healthcare sector, there's actually been some pretty big hits, which is an interesting point, partly because there's this weird um, split in the healthcare sector. You have the emergency workers, the COVID workers, but then you have a whole host of others, dentists, um, Mm. uh, uh, elective surgeries that are done in sort of ambulatory centers where there have been job losses. And so it's really interesting there. And then in terms of the intersection of the two, as we've been sort of following it, I think the biggest things to sort of keep in mind This is a very complicated even data problem because what you have going on is you have reports on a daily basis of number of new COVID cases, but those are critically related to the number of tests being done at any point in time. So the problem there is the number of tests are going up and down, just like the number of cases are. (laughs) And if you don't know what's going on with that, that could really skew the results. Are you getting more cases because you're doing more tests? Or what if, in fact, the number of tests are going down and you're getting more cases? What does that mean? Second big issue is who you're testing is a highly selected sample. This is a classic example of what economists, statisticians call sample selection. Mm. Who's the most likely to get the test? Someone who's showing symptoms. Okay. But what does that tell us about the broader population? Well, it doesn't tell us very much about the broader population. So the third big thing I would say that we've noticed is, you know, averages always lie. I'm not a big fan of averages. <laughs> and, um, we talk about, well, the number of cases in the U.S. Have t- are, are flattened. Well, if you take New York City or New York out of that, that's just not true, right? Cases other places are still going up. We're still on the upswing. Mm. As you start to watch different locales opening up the country in different paces, we have what an economist would call a natural experiment. I'm not happy we have it, but from a data perspective, it's actually really interesting. We should be able to see, if we're thoughtful about it, exactly how the opening of different locations will square with the number of cases. But it's not instantaneous, okay? It's not, they opened yesterday, what happened to cases today? That's just lazy statistics. It's at least with about a two-week lag, right? And then you still have to keep on top of the testing. So what we're trying to do is we're developing sort of a series of models and papers where we're going to actually try to assess the reopening and see what's happening with the cases. And so to me, that's what's really interesting. That's the really big ticket question right now, I think. Um, so those are just some of the insights we've, you know, that we've noticed. And again, we're trying to educate people about different things and just make it as simple as we can. But I mean, I, I was joking with one of my colleagues, you know, this is going to be an amazing final exam for some statistics student about mm. five years. <laughs> but unfortunately, we have to live through it first. So are you have you found any like um examples of stats? that are going out that you're just like questioning, like how legitimate are those numbers? Well, yeah, I mean, I think part of it is just a little bit of laziness and not, not by us. I mean, laziness in terms of reporting numbers. And again, I, I have been doing a lot more media interviews than I'm used to doing. You know, I've done that at different times in my life, but with this, because there's a lot of interest in our work. And I mean, I do find that people, you know, reporters are just trying to get it right, but oftentimes they're on deadline. And so sometimes you see narratives get created where, well, is the data really seeing that or not? You know, the example of, I saw one that was about some part of Florida reopening and the number of coronavirus cases spiking the next day. Well, that's not, that's not causal. Okay. That doesn't mean that it may not go up. I'm not saying that I think that, right. I mean, actually, I pretty much believe it's probably the case that as you reopen, they will go up. But that particular number, that sort of lazy connecting the dots, that's not helpful, right? And so those kind of things are hard. And then also, um, in general, it's so difficult because the other overlay is when a lot of information is coming in a political climate and a highly politicized climate, it's very difficult to get sort of objective numbers out there because there's always a narrative being created around them. And at some point, people believe that they have their own numbers. You know, so that's a little bit of anathema to a statistician and econometrician is like, wait a second, the numbers are what they are. We can view them differently. We can have different approaches, but we should be able to get to some synthesis of what they mean. So I think that's part of it. I mean, another part that I think has been interesting is some of the numbers which are sad about the number of deaths, which are really mind blowing in some respects. Um, But one of the things that is weird about this disease is that, you know, it is clearly exacerbating people that had pre-existing conditions. 
I mean, that's where a lot of the, the really tough health situations are coming about. And so looking at what that means when people talk about the number of deaths and what is it doing in terms of accelerating death rates or, you know, there, there's a lot of interesting issues there. And there's also a lot of interesting issues about the way this is hitting uh, differences in racial disparities, um, communities that are sort of being hit differently. Um, and, you know, we try to report some of that data as well on sort of like what are places that are, you know, really driving this. Um, but it's, you know, it's a, there's a lot of data in a short amount of time. And it's a lot, this is a lot like an elaborate mystery. Like you're trying to piece together the best available information to tell a story. Most of it's not simple. So we try to be pretty upfront that we're, we're doing the best we can with what we have, but we don't have all the answers. And I don't think anybody's in a position to have all the answers. Now, uh, for those, John, who want to um, follow your guys' insights around COVID-19, what's the best way for them to do that? Yeah, we have our blog on uh, it's edgeworthanalytics.com. Obviously, we have all the social media. We're on Twitter, all the other places. But the best place, just go to our website. It's sort of one of our first banners is that. And we basically update our blog there. All of our media hits, all of our different stories go up there. And our dashboards are there. So you can see that. We'll be launching some other state dashboards. We have some other ideas on some other things we're sort of playing with as well. Um, we have a really interesting art um, dashboard from very early on on the restaurant industry where we used uh, publicly available open table data to show the speed with which the reservations dropped off and uh, restaurants closed in the U.S. over that two week period. I mean, that's, it's just really fascinating to see oh, how quickly it happened. So it's like day by day it tracks and just you see the map change. So, so there's some really neat uh, resources there. So just go to edgeworthanalytics.com. Awesome. And for those that are looking to learn more about your guys' consulting work, where should they go? Yeah. So both the two, our two companies, edgeworthaconomics.com, edgeworthanalytics.com. Uh, my bio is there. Contact information is there. Just feel free to reach out. You can email us. There's all of our information there. You can read about our past work um, and all the different things we do. Awesome. John, thank you so much for being on Data Talk. Thank you so much. This was a real pleasure. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Data Talk. We share out new episodes every single week, and you can find the full catalog of previous episodes as well as YouTube videos by going to the Experian News blog. The URL is just experian.com slash data talk. And as always, we love hearing from our community. So if you have any comments or suggestions for future shows, please reach out. You can find us on Twitter at Experian Data Lab, or you can always reach out to me directly. My email is michael.delgado at experian.com. Take care and we'll chat next week.